That was the San Fernando Valley around 1910. Now the San Fernando Valley is just north of Los Angeles. The current population is one and a half million and it's where I live. But more importantly, in 1910 was born a fair fellow by the name of Harold Burroughs Rhodes. A very unlikely name for a valley boy, don't you think? Why am I telling you this? Well, Harold Burroughs Rhodes invented this. And we're going to get into this. This is the Rhodes Piano, also known as the Fender Rhodes Piano. The most insanely marvelous instrument almost ever invented. So let's get started. If you don't know the roads, after this episode, I promise you, you will know the roads and even recordings that you're familiar with, you're going to listen to them again and go, oh my God, that's a Rhodes. I just, wow. And you're going to just recognize it all over the place. This thing is an absolute incredible pedigree in the music world. Um, and it is everywhere and has been imitated a gazillion times, but there's nothing like the original. This baby, this, in, this particular one. I bought this in South Africa when I was just starting out in 1980 Futsac, uh, 1987 to be precise. And I paid 500 Rand for this thing, which in today's money, you're going to laugh, in today's money is $30. I bought it secondhand, but it was in great condition. This is when I started gigging with this very piano. I gigged for six nights a week with this piano for years. And this piano has some stories to tell, which I'm not going to get into now. But um, it's a very special instrument to me. And um, so let's take a look at how this instrument even happened. As I said, Harold Rhodes was born here in the San Fernando Valley in 1910, probably very close to where I live right now, and he became a teacher. He went to USC, University of Southern California, which is where I went, um, and became a teacher. And by the time he was 20, he already had established a piano curriculum called the Harold Rhodes School of Popular Piano. And it was quite popular. It was based on, you know, don't learn those stuffy, boring scales. Um, hear that song on the radio? Here's how you play it. It's, it's pretty easy. Just have fun. And um, it was very popular um, by all accounts. So in 1939, the Second World War started and he was drafted into the military, found himself stationed in Greensboro, which is in North Carolina, I believe, in a hospital. And he started teaching his friends his piano method and word got up to the, the higher ups in the, in the military. And they came to him and proposed that he start a, a music um, rehabilitation program to help wounded soldiers who are coming back from you know Europe or the Pacific or wherever and he immediately obviously took the job but found that he had a problem because they were all in beds recuperating from gunshot wounds or whatever and he had no way of getting a piano to them so they couldn't do music um, and across the field from the hospital um, was an airfield and he noticed these little aluminium tubes hanging off the B-17 bombers and he thought hmm I wonder if I take those and um, and cut them to size kind of like a xylophone and then he built a little um, mechanism um, action so that when you hit the key it would hit this little xylophone like aluminium bar and hey presto he came up with a little piano um, that could fit on the lap of the soldiers who were lying in bed um, Maybe that's why so many B-17s crashed, because he was stealing all the parts. I don't know. And um, he called this the Xylet, um, but it was never commercially produced or, or released. 
But towards the end of his service, he was given a medal by the military for this work that he had done. So after the war ended in 1945, he wanted to bring this to market. Um, so he made, based on the Xylet, um, a piano called the Pre-Piano. And in fact, he unveiled it at the NAMM show in 1946. If you can believe that the NAMM show was happening in 1946. And this, this is a picture of that. Um, there's still a few of them around, um, but they sound more like a toy piano, really. I don't have a Pre-Piano. They're very hard to come by. Um, but luckily, Eric Persing and the good folks at uh, um, Spectrosonics found one and did a fantastic sampling job, as they always do, and it's part of the Keyscape um, um, plugin. And um, so here is that. Now, Harold was never very happy with this, and it kind of became a flop. And he eventually left that world and went off farming as one does but eventually i think he got bored of that and came back to the world of piano and then in 1959 he met leo fender who owned fender guitars and who by that stage um, was a very very popular man manufacturer of guitars and leo fender said to him i'll give you some money let's make a piano together and let's bring it to market um, I've got the name, the distribution through Fender, um, and so they did. But Harold was never very happy with the mids and the highs of the of the technology he was developing and kept on working on. So they released something called the piano bass, which is like the bottom two and a half octaves of like this road. It starts at the low E and goes up two and a half octaves, um, and that was released in 1959. In 1965, CBS Musical Instruments, yes, they were owned by CBS Broadcasting, that you all know, um, and the Musical Instrument Division doesn't exist anymore, but in 1965, they were big and they bought Fender, and along with it, Fender Rhodes. So Harold had some, some resources to, to work with, and so in 1965, his first full-size Rhodes came out, called the Sparkle Top, because, well, it's got a sparkly top. Um, but it wasn't an 88 key. Um, that came later. This was a 73 key and that sat on top of a speaker that they manufactured and it came as a unit and it was called suitcase version and this just took off like wildfire. I mean, it really started in 68 with Miles Davis and it's kind of a famous story. Herbie Hancock was on a session on a record called Miles in the Sky and he was hanging around there like there's no piano and you know, you, you don't always ask Miles questions, I guess. And so eventually when it was quite clear a piano wasn't coming, he said to Miles, what am I supposed to play? And Miles pointed in the corner was a Fender Rhodes sitting and her, I don't think Herbie had ever seen anything like that before. Or maybe they, they just thought it, they used to think those things were toys really. And so Herbie played it on the record. Um, and the first record I really noticed the Rhodes was in Bitch's Brew. And then in, in subsequent recordings, he had, you know, whether it was Herbie Hancock or Chick Corea or Keith Jarrett, um, play the roads and it became uh, it just started a whole movement in jazz 
and from that point on, um, they were serious instruments. Now in 1967, Harold released the Fender Rhodes Celeste, which was just the top sort of four octaves. I think they also made a three octave version, but it was the, basically the top part of the Rhodes. Um, and it wasn't very successful. Very few of them were made. You can't really find them today. Actually, I just saw one on, on for sale on Reverb for 20,000 bucks. Have you got 20,000 bucks to spend on a Celeste? Okay, so Harold Rhodes often referred to himself as an educator first and an inventor second. Um, so he continuously worked on educational stuff and he took the Sparkle Top Roads and built an educational model um, which was meant to be in a classroom and there would be any number of these pianos in a classroom all connected together to um, a piano that was in front of the teacher and, and that had a console where the teacher could listen individually to each and every student just by pushing a button. Um, I used to work on one of those consoles when I taught at the um, Shell School in, in South Africa. Um, and I think we had 40 or 50 of these things in a class. It was massive. And you could listen to each and every student. It was super cool. But in 1970, he released the Mark I stage, which was the piano without the speaker. And even though the speaker had become immensely popular because they were so good, it was a bitch to carry this thing around. And so this was a great solution um, because people could carry it around easier and then plug into the PA system or plug into whatever happened to be there at the gig. In 1972, they released the full-size 88 key version. And from that point on, every model that came out had an 88 key version as well as a 73 version. Um, even though the 73 version remained the most popular. Then in 1974, CBS dropped the Fender line. And so in 1975, they rebranded um, what they had and the first Rhodes piano came out without the Fender name and that was the Rhodes Mark I. Then in 1979 came this baby, the Rhodes Mark II. Now, it's really very similar to the Rhodes Mark I. Um, most of the changes, initially anyway, were cosmetic. Biggest change is they made a flat top. They were finding a lot of keyboard players were going out gigging and wanting to put a synthesizer on top of their Rhodes to play melody lines or whatever, solos. Um, but the synthesizer didn't fit on a round top, and so people were making all these contraptions to make it work. So they were like, okay, we'll just make a flat top. Good thinking. But there were other changes that came um, more slowly. For example, um, a year or two into the run of this Mark II, um, they did away with a wood keybed and that became a plastic keybed. I was lucky enough to get one of the ones with a wood keybed. 
And then they made other changes with the hammers and the tines and they were constantly playing between quality and profit and going back and forth between the two. But you know, Rhodes are very individual instruments and no two Rhodes are the same. Um, and that's the beauty of this instrument. And then in 1980, they released a 54 key version, which is even smaller than this guy. And they did that because some keyboard players gigging in bands that didn't need that lower register and wanted something a bit lighter to carry around um, would have gone for a 54 key. Um, it didn't do that well, and you don't find too many of those around today. And then in 1980, they came out with a Rhodes 3 EK10, which is basically this guy, but with a synthesized um, component built into it. And this was the result of them beginning to get scared as the 80s started that synthesizers were becoming so popular and they were so much easier to carry. Um, so they wanted to incorporate a bit of that technology. But what eventually drove the nail into the coffin of the Rhodes Company and the eventual demise of the Rhodes was the DX7 synthesizer made by Yamaha, which was released in 1983. Now, synthesizers were already becoming popular. But the DX7 was different. It was an FM based synth and so could emulate acoustic instruments a lot more accurately than other synths of the day, analog synths. And so um, people started finding that they could go to a gig with a DX7 and bring up piano sounds and, and electric piano sounds and get by just fine. And it was a lot easier to carry, a lot more portable than this guy. And I remember patch number 11 on the DX7 was a Fender Rhodes emulation. And it was pretty decent. You've heard that sound on a lot of records. Now, before the poor old Rhodes eventually died, in 1984, they released the Rhodes Mark V. And that looks a bit different. Check it out. It had an all plastic body. It had wooden key beds that went back to the wood and they went back to some of the way the mechanism used to work in the Mark I. And so the, the piano was lighter and it played better according to many. This instrument is said to be Harold's favorite of the Rhodes pianos, his favorite model. And it was fairly popular, but you don't find them too much today. I've only ever played one once. Um, but unfortunately in 1985, the Rhodes Company folded. That was the end of the Rhodes. The Mark V had only been in production for, for a little bit more than a year. And they decided to close their doors. They had a huge factory down here in Fullerton in Orange County that had like a thousand employees. And they shut it down. And that was almost the end of the Rhodes story. <laughs> In 1987, however, the Roland Company released the Roland Rhodes. I had one of these babies and I gigged with it and it was eventually stolen from one of the nightclubs I was playing in. I liked this piano. It was really nice, easier to carry around than this guy, um, but still a very heavy weighty piano. Um, but it wasn't popular. They didn't make millions of them and you don't really find them around today. Um, and apparently Harold Rhodes was never informed nor had ever consented to Roland taking his name. And he went into a legal battle that he eventually won 10 years later. I think in 1997, he eventually won the Rhodes name back. But sadly, only in time for him to basically pass away 
um, which happened in 2000. And so that was the real end of the road story. Now the Fender Rhodes is an electroacoustic instrument, meaning that there's it's half acoustic and half electric, much like the electric guitar. When you strum those strings, that those are real strings and they're making a real sound, but, but it's pretty quiet, so you need to amplify them, and that's what the pickup is. Well, it's exactly the same with this guy. I'm gonna take this top off and we're gonna dig in deeper and have a look how this thing works. Because I've removed the top, and so here it is naked in all its glory. Um, first thing to notice is the date. So this was manufactured in the 28th week of 1980. So in July or somewhere around there, that's how this numbering system works. And here's the serial number. And then here is the soundboard. Well, it's not really a soundboard, but it's the board where everything's bolted onto. And there are all these rows of tone bars. And these are what provide the vibration for, for the sound to basically amplify. So basically how this works, is it's like a piano, it has a piano um, hammer mechanism. And I'm gonna open this up and basically these are the things with the black are the hammers. And when you hit a key, the hammer goes up like that. I don't know if you can see, it's difficult to see, but behind each tone bar, um, below it is a tine, a little piece, that looks like a piece of straight wire with a little spring on the end of it. And that is the time, that is what actually makes the sound that gets picked up. Um, the tone bar helps it vibrate. Um, so when you hit a note, you can see there that the, the block of felt removes itself from the time, and that black hammer strikes the time, causing it to vibrate until you let go of the note and then the felt returns to stop it vibrating. Or if you have your sustain pedal on, like this, that just removes the felts from all the tines. That's why when you play a note, it will go on sustaining until you lift your foot off the pedal. Now each tine is pointed towards these little white things which are the pickups. And you can see they're all wired together and they are basically just exactly like a guitar pickup. Um, and each note has its own little pickup. And so adjusting the closeness of the pickup to the tine and where the tine is in relation to the pickup and left and right, all these things um, are what all go together to make a piano have its action. And that's why no two Rhodes pianos are exactly alike. And the little springs are, um, are for tuning. So if your um, tine goes out of tune, you just move that spring a little bit to adjust the tuning. And so that's it in a nutshell, as I say, this is all uh, an acoustic physical mechanism. The hammer striking the time, the time vibrating, um, but then the pickups and from there on out is electrical. So that's why it's called electroacoustic instrument. Now I used to have an active pickup circuitry in here, which sounds a bit better. Um, and it was great for being in the nightclub, but um, you have to replace the battery in it, you know, every month or so. And I just got tired of doing that. So I went back to the original passive um, um, electronic wiring in here, which is what it came with. But people have done all sorts of modifications on these things. Dino My Road was one of the most um, popular where they really, um, really suit the thing up completely in every way. But I just kind of like it, you know, standard the way it is. Okay, so just one thing, this is the top that I took off, but under the top, I put a whole bunch of tin foil in there um, because when I was playing in, in the nightclubs with the active um, circuitry in there and the keyboard on top um, and then not knowing what the hell you were plugged into in the nightclub, I would often get ground hums um, or interfer electronic interference and, um, and this helps alleviate that somewhat. How can you buy or sell the sky? 
the warmth of the land. The idea is strange to us. If we do not own the freshness of the air and the sparkle of the water, how can you buy them? 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 Now, just a side note, kind of an interesting story. When I started working on this episode, um, I decided I need to get my roads fixed. It'd been about 15 years since I last had this thing worked on and tuned and whatever. So I called up the guy who tuned it last time and he was moving shop. Couldn't do it. Then I called up the the next guy in line who, who he had recommended, who was too busy. He said, I can only do it in four weeks. Um, but I've got this guy, this other guy. So I went to this other guy. His name's Ben Bove. And he said, yeah, I can do it. Um, and I said, great, let's, let's, let's get it done. And I went over there and he said, oh, by the way, I did a documentary on the roads. And I was like, what? And he gave me the documentary and, and a beautiful book um, called Down the Roads. And it really is the Bible. It's the authority on the roads. I mean, this guy, Ben, did an incredible job of this documentary. It's available on Quest TV. You've got to go and check it out. It's just there's no other documentary uh, that comes even close um, to, to explaining the whole history of the roads. And he interviews the most amazing set of musicians um, who have played the roads, like Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock, um, George Duke, blah, blah, blah. It's just an amazing documentary. Go check it out. Another great resource is FenderRoads.com. They have a lot of history um, in, in, on that website about the Fender Roads uh, and also a lot of resources about you know where to find them, who's selling them, how to get them tuned up, blah, blah, blah. So thank you for watching this episode on the roads. This has been an amazing episode to do. Um, I've learned so much about this very special instrument and I'm even more in love with this thing now than I used to be. What a great story, what an insane story, and what a legacy dear old Mr. Harold Rhodes left the world. So please subscribe, please hit that bell button so that you get notified, and don't ever stop learning. I'll catch you on the next one. Here's a story about karma. I was playing in a band six nights a week down in Durban, South Africa, and we were at this club called the Riviera, um, and it was a hokey little bar. It was a sailor bar. There were a lot of prostitutes around. There were fights every night almost, and one time this fight broke out and someone went crashing into the PA system, which was right next to my roads, and on top of my roads I had a DX7. The PA system fell onto the DX7, crushed it, and left this roads absolutely untouched. And so the evil DX7 got crushed and died in saving the Rhodes piano. And that is a little Rhodes calm story that I'm sure is making Harold smile right about now.